thank you everyone at Mirror Number 9 who stayed with us, as well as everybody who's watching on WNUB TV and listen to WNUB Radio. You will not be disappointed that you did stay tuned. Um, we are dealing with today the conspiracy to frame Dr. Malachi Z. York. Um, in our first segment, we had some very powerful information rendered by three people who were uh, privy to the what is known as the South Beach Conspiracy, or one aspect of those conspirators who got together to plot against Dr. Malachi Z. York. And now we have a, a different perspective we want to offer, because we have those who were involved with the South Beach aspect of the conspiracy, but then people are left with, well, what about those people who weren't on that trip? Why did they come together and conspire against Dr. Malachi Z. York? So we have um, several members of Dr. York's family, as well as people who were members of the community on Tamare, uh, 404 Shadydale Road. We also have Sister Fair and Brother Bernard joining us from the first part of our program to give their insights on what is the mentality behind the conspiracy. Um, so we would like to start with um, Sister Hager. If you could kind of give your viewpoint dealing as someone who grew up in the community, interacted with a lot of the people who did get involved, what, what is your perception of why they did what they did? And kind of, kind of explain the nature of the community that may have bred the type of mentality to do something that was so devious as to plot against our master teacher. Well, that family. Um, well, we did grow up in a community. Um, we did grow up with a cultural lifestyle. Uh, the whole purpose behind it was to teach us how to better ourselves as people, as the Brother Katie's mentioned earlier, um, to seek a certain level of spirituality towards the Most High. And, um, you know, we were living a cultural lifestyle or trying to adapt a cultural life, uh, a, way to, a way of living in America, which is very difficult to do. Um, because even though it says that every, you know, everyone has an equal rights here, equal equal place here is actually not a fact. That's really not the case, unfortunately. Um, you know, when you're different, you're treated so. And, you know, in the children growing up in the community, there was a lot of wonderful memories, a lot of beautiful things that uh, was given to us um, by my father, but also by, you know, a various number of people who have you know, worked with him. There's been a various number of organizations that were established. Um, and also even in the case where as New Wapians, well, the word New Wapians is labeled as if it's a religion. It's our race, you know, it's, it's who we are, it's our culture. Um, and, you know, I wanted to say basically like, the word New Wapians to me is like saying Caucasians to the whites. But they take it and say, well, when we say New Orleans and we're a different breed or we're a special group, but, you know. But um, the conspiracy basically started when you had a, a bunch of people who were unhappy with a cultural lifestyle, growing up and expecting certain things out of the community. There were people who felt that when they became an age of, of adulthood that they would have, you know, a large house and a car in the driveway and, you know, lots of money and success for themselves as an individual and not so much working towards um, success as far as... In speaking to some of these people, their issues are really minor things that started with conversation and was the ideas were introduced to them that you can take this to another level. Because the reality is that living in a community in a sheltered, somewhat sheltered environment they don't even know what child molestation is. Like there was no, there was that was not a part of our lifestyle. It was just something that didn't happen. I mean, even in Brooklyn, the children were separated from the adults. You had the children; they were raised by different parents, taking turns and doing their part to, as far as teaching the children and all of that. But it wasn't a thing where your children would just be around adults with bad habits, or it just wasn't the type of thing that we were used to. And so. And so they had no idea what they were being put up against. That's why I would say they were definitely coerced. It was definitely a lot of coercion. And the, the, the disgruntledness go beyond the children. I won't even say children. Uh, I'm having difficulty.
the reality is that these weren't children, and that was painted to the media as if there was a bunch of little children that said, somebody molested me. If we get down to the nitty gritty, the reality is that it's grown folks that went and said whatever and put together this conspiracy. There are no children in the case. There are no underage children in the indictment. Everybody in the indictment is over 17 years old. There's nobody underage in the, in the case. And so they had, you know, uh, they're functioning adults and they, uh, they have to take responsibility for their actions and they're well aware of what they were doing. It's not as if, it's not like the innocence of a child where you go to a child and say, did this happen to you? And out of innocence, a child says, well, this, 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 and that. They're just honest. But these are grown adults. There are no children. And when all of our children, the actual children, um, after the raid, and they took away, what, five of our children, as well as many others that were tested, all these children were, were in the clear, I would say. Nobody's been touched. None of the children were psychologically affected any kind of way other than the raid, which was when they came in saying, we're here to save you guys from this guy. They came in and gave our children the issues that they didn't have prior to that day. I mean, you know, realistically, I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, they come in there, all these hundreds of helicopters and SWAT teams jumping out the planes and you know, the throwing children and dragging people. I mean, come on, we didn't have any issues. Our children had no issues prior to that. And then at the end of this, they're gonna tell them, well, you need psychological evaluation and you need, um, they gave them basically what I call a credit card to mental help. You know, they told them, oh yeah, we're gonna make sure that y'all are compensated. You're gonna get restitution for doing this. And what they gave them is they took a psychologist and paid him all this money that they confiscated from us and said if any of them decide that they want psychological help, you can give it to them and we'll pay you. This is what they got from doing this. And the reality is that if they were in fact competent enough to get up on the government's uh, stand and testify to give an innocent man 135 years, if you were competent enough to withstand trial, to give someone 135 years, you need psychological help? I mean, like, come on, like, if these people need psychological help, then why are they able to testify? If they were competent, then they should have just been giving them a big fat check, like, here, go start your life, because you're competent, and you got rid of the bad guy. But yet they're telling them, you need psychological help. So, but you were competent enough to give a man 135 years? I mean, it's like, come on. You know? How can you accept the, you know, the art? It's like, how can you, I, I think that what she's saying is, how can you even accept what they're saying if you're saying that they're mentally incompetent? If they're crazy, then, you know, how is it that they're able to sit on the witness stand against him. It's just not, it doesn't make sense. So that's a very good point. Right. And, you know, and that's one of the things that really disturbed me. And I mean, to be honest with you, I can't say that I grew up with these girls. I mean, I grew up in Trinidad and I think we had kind of a don't play that uh, model down there. I mean, we live like by the information. I mean, for real. However, I came here at 15, I met a lot of the, them at 15, and things that was just like a no-no to us. I mean, the girls were like curious, they wanted to go to school. I remember Pop saying that the adults fought him on the subject of the kids going to school versus them being homeschooled. And the vote was taken, which means Pop did not make all the sole decisions because he didn't want his children home. I wasn't, I didn't go to public school, I went to home, I was homeschooled. So he had, a, you know, people had a choice. They were able to make it.